Welcome to Behind the News. I am Halima Sadia and I am joined in the studio with MPP Natalia Kasandova. She is Progressive Conservatives MPP. We are going to talk about various, ish ver various issues which are headlines in the news right now and we want to see her stance, her party's clear stance on those issues. I welcome you Natalia to our studio today. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, let's start with your one and a half year of progressive conservatives action and reaction and achievements and challenges of your government. Thank you. And definitely all of the above we've had in this past year. Uh, I can't believe it's already been a year. We've recently celebrated our one year anniversary uh, of being uh, the government of Ontario with a strong progressive conservative majority. And we've come far. We've come so far in, in this one one year. Uh, you know, we've passed a record 25 pieces of legislation, which is historic for any new government. So, you know, we got right to work uh, from the day we were elected because there were so many promises that we made to the people of Ontario. Ontario. And actually, I'm happy to report that we've delivered to 90% of those promises already in just year one. So right away, we got to work. And the, the number one thing that we were elected to do is to bring fiscal responsibility back to Ontario. As many of you know, our, our province is in a lot of debt. Uh, this debt will be passed on to future generations. And I think it's our responsibility to make sure that we respect every single taxpayer dollar. So some of you know that when we first came into power, our deficit was $15 billion. For me, that's a huge number. Most people don't even think in terms of billions of dollars, right? But what we were able to do in just the first year with our line-by-line -line audit conducted by our Treasury Board President, Minister Bethlehem Falvey, was save already $3 billion simply going line-by-line by line in every single ministry and looking how we can more effectively spend those taxpayer dollars. But to put things into perspective, you know, right now in Ontario, for every hour we pay $1.4 million in interest. That's a lot of money that we're just paying for interest and not even paying off our principal debt. How many hospital beds could we open up for $1.4 million? And that's every hour. Th this is money that we could invest better into things that matter the most, like education and healthcare. So I'm just so proud to be a member of this progressive conservative government under the leadership of our Premier Doug Ford, because the change that we're making in Ontario is monumental. Um, what else have we done? We're opening Ontario up for business. You know, we're we're making sure that our environment uh, is um, uh, is allowing businesses to prosper. Because our fundamental philosophy in our progressive conservative government is that the government is not a job creator. A government is the creator of an environment in which businesses thrive. Because we know when our businesses thrive, our employees thrive and our economy thrives. So we were able to create over 200,000 jobs in the past year. And that's a huge, huge achievement for our government. And to be honest with you, we actually don't have all the uh, people to fill those jobs right now. So, so we have a bit of an imbalance. We have too many jobs in Ontario, which is, I think, a situation that we haven't had in the past. So we're really working um, you know, to, uh, on tackling those issues so a lot of buzz because of huge uh, cuts fundings and people are crying and people are having a lot of rage against the government so what is your take on that so I don't like the word cut to be honest because I feel it's really misleading to the public and I know that the media have been using the word cut a lot but in reality what has happened we are actually investing five billion dollars more that's five billion with a B dollars more this year than the previous government, right? So if we talk in terms of cuts, well, let's look at the numbers. So in each ministry, we're actually increasing spending or in many of the ministries, we're increasing spending. For example, education, we've invested $700 million more in this fiscal year. In healthcare, $1.3 billion more in this pr particular fiscal year. With back to school, what are the changes in the school system we should anticipate? Well, thank you. That's a very important question because as we go back to school, we've made some changes to the curricula. Top of mind for many parents and educators has been the health and physical education curriculum, which we have upgraded, as, as you know. And so some things that we've introduced that were not previously in this curriculum were things like mental health. This is very important because we need to really build resilience among our students. Times are changing. Social media has becoming such a strong presence in our schools. So we need to make sure that we uh, equip our students with the right uh, coping 
strategies and tactics when it comes to having an online presence, but also things like social emotional learning skills, uh, active living, uh, movement competence, and healthy living, you know, topics like talking about consent and healthy relationships. Those are all things that are in introduced in the new curricula. We never thought about it, but I think it's the most important thing to discuss such things which are the basic foundation for re uh, relations and for building bridges between different kind of students, you know, because we are having international students with us too. Absolutely, and we also made sure that th that curriculum in particular is age appropriate. So we've listened to the parents and we've listened, we've done this uh, major consultation, over 700, uh, 7 um, thousand respondents uh, to our online survey about the uh, health and physical education curriculum. So we've done a major consultation and we took all of those results and the input and we've uh, we tried to come with a balanced approach to make sure that the topics that are important are covered but also that they're age appropriate. Another thing that we've done is that we're actually giving parents to a 14 day notice if they wish to take their children out of school for certain aspects of the curricula because we really do believe that parents should be in in charge of their children's education and if they feel like the certain aspects they can be taught better at home we are giving them that option to opt out of certain aspects of that curricula but you know what's even more exciting we're up we're updating our math curriculum because you know unfortunately based on the last EQA scores on, uh, EQAO scores only 49 percent of our grade six students are passing the the math component and you know I think our, our students can do better and we need to really make sure we're investing in them and so that's why uh, we're upgrading the the math curriculum but furthermore we're also focusing on STEM on the STEM subject sciences technology engineering and math because these are really, this is where the jobs of tomorrow lie. So we need to make sure that our students, as they graduate, are achieving competencies in those areas. So then they're um, employable in the global market. As you mentioned, we're competing with all the other countries. We live in a global society. So we need to make sure that our math curricula and our science curricula are keeping up to date. Yeah, we need to invest in our future. And the best investment is our children who are going to be the taking over for our tomorrow. Couldn't so let's more. talk about the disappointments so far about your government mm -hmm. and their achievements. How would you like to comment on that? So, I mean, you know, uh, being in government, uh, we need to show leadership. We were elected um, to clean up our fiscal books, and that's what, exactly what we're doing. And the hard part about leadership and, and being the governing party is setting out those priorities. And so, you know, we're delivering on our campaign promises, and, and we've done 90% of the work already. Um, but there's so much more work to do because every single file we look at, um, it needs improvement and so I wouldn't call it disappointment I would call it learning opportunities because as any new government it takes time you know uh, there is the whole process of uh, learning forming storming norming and then performing so I think after one year of, of being the government we have went through that process as a group as a, a collaborative team of MPPs and you know our premier always says we're all all stars and and uh, he really does take good care of us in terms of making sure that uh, we feel like we're listened to and that the voice of our constituents are heard when we have our caucus meetings but I think we're at a very comfortable position now where we're we're ready to perform and really um, you know continue uh, uh, delivering on our campaign promises but also making those priorities which th this is what the government has to do is um, set the priorities for our province and and it's normal, not everyone will like the direction we're going, um, and that's quite normal, right? Uh, every decision we make, someone may be unhappy, but what our role is to do is to make sure that every decision we make is improving the lives of Ontarians, and that's what exactly we're doing. Rome was not built overnight, so the process where you are right now uh, will take some time because mm -hmm. it reached to the point after so much time, mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. So let's come back. Any final message before we wind up our uh, show today? Would you like to give any message to our audience through us? You're more than welcome to do so. Well, I just wanted to once again thank to all my constituents in Mississauga Center for your support and uh, for always keeping me engaged for all your emails and all your inquiries. I always love hearing from you uh, about any provincial issues. I wanted to invite you to my annual barbecue, which is taking place on September 14th at Mississauga Valley. It's a free event for the family. There will be face painting. There will be a bouncing castle. I'm also having a health fair, so I have some health professionals coming to talk about healthy eating, to talk about mental health 
health. Um, so please come on out with the whole family. And one last thing I wanted to talk about today is um, uh, International Opioid Overdose Awareness Day, which is coming up on August 31st. Uh, I have actually introduced my private member's bill uh, to make sure that all our police officers are, uh, are trained in the use of naloxone. And naloxone is a medication that can be easily um, administered via a nasal spray injection to uh, reverse the effect of an opioid. So meaning if someone is um, not responsive and we think that they might have overdosed on an opioid, um, a police officer can easily administer this me medication and essentially save that victim's life. And so um, this day is coming up on August 31st and I just wanted to encourage everyone to get more educated about what naloxone is because it is a life-saving medication and it is available free of charge at any local pharmacy in Ontario. So if you have an office um, for my constituency office, I have one, I have a kit in my office. I'm encouraging all of you to get more educated and pick up your naloxone kit, keep it in your car. You never know when you might use it and you can save a person's life. So um, just encourage you to, to do that. I thank you MPP Natalia Kasindova for being with us today and giving education about PC mm -hmm. policies to our viewers. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Canada is going through a very, very sensitive time. It's time to see the policies in detail. Go and search on the net and see what, what really matters to Canadian. Canada for Canadians first. With these words, thank you very much for watching Behind the News with me today. And we will stay in touch for more news.